Hello, everyone. I'm Tanuja Kopal, Contributing Editor for Lab Manager, and thank you for taking the time to join us for our product spotlight webinar hosted by Lab Manager in partnership with Agilent Technologies. Today we are joined by Shay Taylor, who is the Global Cross Lab Product Marketing Program Manager at Agilent Technologies, which provides vendor-neutral instrument services as well as lab-wide enterprise solutions. Prior to this position, Shay was a field service engineer and account manager at Agilent, and before joining Agilent, she was an analytical chemist and a training coordinator at Wyatt, which then became a part of Pfizer Pharmaceuticals. So today she is uh, going to help you think about ways to maximize your lab productivity, both from an instrument productivity standpoint as well as from a business standpoint. And as she is going over her talk, I'm sure a lot of questions will come to your mind. And as they do, please type it into the question box. This is uh, the box that you see on the left-hand side of your screen. And all you have to do is type in your questions or comments and hit submit. We will be receiving those on uh, on our end, and we will definitely get to your comments and questions after Shay is done with her talk. Today's webinar will be archived on Lab Manager's website, and we will be sending you the web link uh, via email in a couple of days. You can definitely go back and review the webinar, or you can forward that link along to colleagues who you think may be interested in this topic. But please note that you will not be able to download any slides from the archive. For a copy of the slides, I think the best thing to do would be to reach out to Shay, and we will share her email address with you in our closing slide. Um, also, just to point out, the webinar platform that you're viewing right now is really very user-friendly. Uh, you can expand the text, the slide window, by dragging out the bottom right-hand corner. Um, and you can also download any resources related to this topic in the resource widget that you see on your screen. These resources have been provided by Agilent and are very specific to the topic that we'll be discussing today. So without further delay, let me welcome Shay to the webinar and turn it over to her. Thank you, Tanisha. And thanks to everyone on the line. I appreciate you taking the time today to, uh, to spend an hour with me. Um, I know everyone has really busy schedules and... Uh, uh, I recognize that um, that you could be spending this hour elsewhere, and I really appreciate your attendance. Mm -hmm. So today's topic is uh, maximizing your lab productivity using two tools that we offer at Agile Technologies, which is Remote Advisor and our laboratory business intelligence tool. So. A lot of the feedback that um, I get frequently from our customers is that they're telling us that they're being held to ever-increasing higher expectations for business results. There's a lot of pressure that they're feeling to increase their throughput and their productivity. And at the same time, uh, they're also uh, under a lot of uh, pressure to reduce their laboratory, laboratory maintenance and supplies costs. And in addition to all of this, this extra pressure, there's an increased scrutiny as to what kind of results they're able to, to produce at the end of the day after making these, these changes. In order to achieve these types of results, our customers really need to think carefully about how they can best manage their laboratory operating costs, how they can reduce the total cost of ownership for their, their lab equipment, and what things they can do to help drive laboratory operational efficiencies. Some of the challenges that our customers are, are facing is um, additional financial justification to purchase new equipment, to retain and maintain existing equipment. Um, all of these, these types of investments are being heavily scrutinized by their executives. Executives want to make sure that they know where their money is going and how those resources will be utilized. And they want to make sure that they're getting the biggest bang for their investment dollar. Additionally, our customers tell us that um, it's really difficult to have an accurate asset inventory. Some customers have, have no way of knowing uh, what it, assets they have in their inventory or where they are. Some of them have a partial list or view. Um, but it's, it's, it's rare to come across someone that has a complete uh, view and, and full control over their, their inventory. 
And when you think about your asset inventory, you should think about it in, in five basic questions. Like what, what is it? What, what type of equipment is it? Where is it located? Uh, what lab is it located in? If it's in, in a different site or even in a different country? Why do you have that piece of equipment? What is it being used for? Is it dedicated to a specific method? Is it um, being used for, for general testing procedures by a community lab? Where is it in terms of its productivity? Is it down a lot and not being utilized effectively, or is it being used 24-7? And then what's its overall condition? Um, you would think about things like age, uh, where it is in terms of uh, Technology is it is it um, uh, older technology that maybe needs to you need to think about replacing? Is it in a harsh environment that's going to shorten its lifespan? Th those kinds of things. Additionally, and I'm sure many of you have had experience with this, many bench scientists are really protective of the equipment that they have, even if they're not using it. They they jump through all the hoops and and you know filled out all the paperwork and they finally get. Uh, a new piece of equipment or a new to them piece of equipment in their area, the last thing they want to do is let go of this piece of equipment, even if it could be put to better use somewhere else in the laboratory. And then finally, there's this lack of tools that our customers can use to manage the data for large numbers of assets that are dispersed across many laboratories, multiple sites, um, and that these sites could even be scattered across the country or even across the globe. So before we go any further, since we're talking about this whole idea of productivity, um, I want to take a moment to make sure that uh, we differentiate between productivity versus efficiency, because they're really quite different. Productivity is not equal to efficiency, even though sometimes you hear people interchanging the two terms. It's actually a reciprocal relationship with two different mindsets. Um, Productivity is focused on how much output can you get per unit of, of input. And the focus is on maximizing that output. Whereas efficiency is the exact opposite. It's how much input is needed to get out each unit of output. And the focus is on minimizing the investment of that input. So if you, if you look at this table that I have up here, um, you can see as we work from the top down, that's uh, increasing efficiency focus, so you're more focused on, on minimizing those inputs, and you're concerned with things like sample prep and management, sample workflow, and data output. Whereas if you're moving from the bottom up, that's where you're increasing your productivity focus. And the higher up you go, usually the higher up in the organization you're going as well. So um, at the bottom of the, the chart, this is much more in the lab, you know, right on the front lines doing your, your, your sample work, uh, whereas at the top of the, of the graph, um, this is at a corporate level where you have executives that are concerned with things like their return on investment and, and balancing their, their capital and labor inputs as well. So ultimately, productivity and efficiency are a balancing act. Um, you can't really have one without the other. Productivity um, is focused on things like making sure that there's redundant instruments for critical operations. You know, you wouldn't want an instrument to go down and uh, stop your, your production lines or, or inhibit your ability to release product. Whereas efficiency is you want the fewest number of instruments to complete the job, but the less investment you have to make into those instruments um, the, the, the better from an efficiency standpoint. Productivity uh, tends to want to uh, make decisions around technology refresh in a timely fashion in order to maximize utility, uh, especially so that they can take advantage of some of the benefits, the new um, improvements that, that will make, uh, make their lives easier, make uh, their analysis shorter or cleaner or more sensitive. Um, it, from the efficiency standpoint, uh, they're less likely to invest in new technology, um, particularly in a timely fashion. Instead, they want to extend the max, um, maximum instrument mechanical life uh, as far as they can and, and, and eke out as much as they can from that one particular instrument. Um, 
another factor of uh, the productivity mindset would be outsourcing instrument services to uh, increase your scientists' focus on science so they can actually be doing the job that they were hired for, which is completing their analysis, as opposed to um, spending their time, their valuable time, um, maintaining and repairing their instrumentation. The efficiency mindset would have those, those folks maintaining and, uh, and repairing their own instruments because uh, when you use in-house resources, typically you have a faster response time and uh, the cost can be less um, in terms of just uh, hours. Finally, with productivity, um, you're maximizing your samples per unit of time, let's say the number of samples in a given day, and you're maximizing the valid data for that same unit of time. In efficiency, you're minimizing your cost for the sample and your cost per data point. So when you're looking at your business from a productivity mindset, the things that um, you should be concerned with are instrument productivity and corporate productivity. So instrument productivity, again, is maximizing that instrument uptime, minimizing service response time, maximizing your, your utilization for your instruments, and making sure that you have the right equipment in place that best fits the needs of your method. Mm -hmm. Corporate productivity, um, are, they're more concerned with having fast, clean audits with, with no citations from the auditing agencies. Uh, maximizing the sample revenue per day, maximizing the number of NDAs or new drug applications each year, and minimizing their manufacturing downtime. Now you notice as I, as I went through those two that there were some efficiency focuses um, that, that were not necessarily pure productivity. And that comes back into making sure you're balancing productivity and efficiency. So at Actualent, we offer something called Cross Lab Enterprise Services. Um, and our technology solutions, which would be remote advisor and laboratory business intelligence, make up one leg of, of this service solution, of the Cross Lab Enterprise Services solution. So I'd, I'd like to take just a few minutes to go over the other two so you can see how it all fits together. Now I'll start with the consolidated services. Um, consolidated services means that we offer consolidated service management. So rather than having multiple OEMs that you're dealing with, multiple POs, multiple contracts, you would just have one vendor, Agilent, um, with one PO and one contract to cover everything in your lab regardless of who the manufacturer is. As part of that, we offer dedicated labor in a couple of different forms. The first is a dedicated engagement manager. And this person is the, the one person you would go to with any questions, problems, or concerns that you have. And um, that person would make sure that those issues get resolved, that your questions get answered. They also deliver on a regular basis at, at a minimum quarterly, more frequently if you want um, a business review of your entire account, and, uh, and that's customized based on what's important to you. Um, you'd also have a dedicated workload administrator. So rather than having to call in your service calls to a, a call center um, and troubleshoot over the phone and go through the phone tree or having to log your call on, on the Internet and wait for an engineer to call you back to do the troubleshooting, um, instead you would call the, your dedicated workload administrator, and she would take down all the information, and would automatically assign the call directly to an engineer and, uh, and would order any parts that were needed. And that brings us to the, the third component of our, of our dedicated uh, labor, and that would be an on-site engineer. This could be, um, depending on the size of your engagement, it could be anywhere from a couple of hours for one engineer a week all the way up to many engineers on-site uh, full-time uh, 40 hours a week in order to support your contract. This, um, this allows them to have much faster response times. They can address your, your issues and, and any, uh, any repairs that pop up um, very quickly in very timely fashion. And as part of that, we would also have an on-site parts cache that would be on your site in a secure location that the engineer could go and access um, and use these parts and supplies to service and maintain your equipment. 
again, reducing that downtime. Um, and and this, this model is a really simple, flexible, scalable solution. So regardless of if you're a small lab um, or a large lab or if you're consolidating uh, multiple labs into one site or you're expanding and, uh, and opening new labs in different sites, different countries, um, we can adjust and scale the solution to meet your specific needs. So the next piece of this is the compliance solution. And as part of the, uh, our compliance solution, we offer completely harmonized preventive maintenance and qualification protocols that are 100% vendor neutral. So it doesn't matter who made the equipment, our protocols will, um, will be able to address all of those uh, different manufacturers and uh, provide the services needed. This means that all your documentation will be consistent, which ultimately reduces your cost and regulatory risk because you know multiple different types of qualifications make uh, FDA auditors and other other auditing agencies scrutinize and ask a lot more questions. There, there's also um, flexibility to configure these tests to meet your specific SOP requirements. So it's not just a a canned black and white take it or leave it kind of document. It's fully automated through our Agilent compliance engine, which uh, reduces um, errors from uh, typing in information or writing down information. And everything is electronic. All of the reports are ele electronic. Um, all the signatures are electronic. And everything is burned to a, um, to a disk that will have all of the protocols, all of the um, procedures, so all the raw data as, as well as the calculated data and final results, and then, of course, the, the electronic signatures. So the only physical signature will be on the front of that disk. And of course, you're welcome to print it out if you still want to have a paper copy of it, but, um, but that will be your option. And then technology solutions, the third one is what we're going to spend the bulk of today discussing about. <laughs> So we like to think of our service as being a, a whole lab service value model. So at the bottom of this pyramid is all of your foundational services. These are things that every lab needs for their equipment. Um, how are you going to maintain it? Uh, does it need qualifications? Um, what kind of repairs need to be done? And, and who's going to do that? Of course, we try to simplify this for our customers by offering a single vendor solution um, so that we could just come in and take care of everything. They wouldn't have to um, deal with multiple vendors or multiple contracts. As you move up this pyramid, you're going to have increasing value and increasing productivity and, and have more opportunities to op optimize your laboratory uh, business objectives. So the second tier is this idea of lab-wide asset management. Um, and that's where we would take care of an inventory of your, your lab equipment, um, what work orders are associated with, with which instruments, if there are any parts that are used, which parts were used and why, um, having additional parts procurement for your on-site parts cache, that kind of thing. And then the third, uh, the third tier of the pyramid, which is the focus of today, is around data analytics and business intelligence. So um, this is lab operations data management, um, uh, where we collect data from multiple different sources. We analyze it. We put it in a variety of reports, depending on how you want to see that data. Um, the asset inventory can also be reported in a variety of ways. We can evaluate your lab productivity and, of course, um, track the life cycle of your equipment. Um, as it moves from a, a new acquisition all the way until it's time for it to be retired or repurposed. And then the final apex of this pyramid is lab operations. And this is where we really become a strategic business partner with our customers and start engaging with them around topics such as your, your workflow management equipment and evaluating your, your staff. Or does it make sense to enforce some, some things or do some staff augmentation? in order to, um, to optimize your, your business performance. So in a nutshell, what does this mean for you, the customer? Um, it helps you to achieve your operational excellence. Um, 
and uh, and maximize the productivity of, of your lab. And there's many different ways that we can we can do this using our technology solutions, and we'll get into that as we go along. It will also look um, at, at optimizing the, the, the big three, scientific, technological, and economic performance. So scientific, of course, would be, you know, how can we, how can we optimize your analyses? Technological is how can we optimize your, your instrumentation at the time to move to a new technology platform? And then economic performance, where can we, where can we make improvements? Where, where can we reduce your spend or reduce your cost of ownership? And, and all of these packaged together are, are, is, is the benefit of having a total Agilent solution. So laboratory business intelligence, or LBI, essentially collects data from many different sources. Some types of data that are collected are financial data for the assets, um, operational data, service data, and, and some other additional types of data as well. This data is then analyzed by our, our LBI engine and um, is utilized to identify different business benefits. For example, we can use this data to look for opportunities to maximize your return on investment, uh, to maximize utilization and capacity of your instruments, to minimize downtime, minimize um, your waste, like lamp burn or solvent waste that's generated by LCs, for example. The data can also be used to help answer other questions, such as, should I have this instrument under contract? Is it really critical to my business operations? If it is, then the answer to that is probably yes, and I want the best contract. So the second part of that question is, if I am going to put it under contract, what would be the best contract for it? Um, should I buy new instrumentation? Is it time to retire this instrumentation? Or maybe I should even consider leasing instrumentation because I know that this is a short-term project. And maybe I don't want to make such a big investment in, uh, in purchasing equipment that after this project is probably just going to sit there. And then when does the instrument need to be re re replaced? And when it's, when it's time to think of a migration strategy for instrumentation, are we going to consider just flat out retiring it? Is it going to be repurposed to a different lab or a different site where we could still eke out a little more use out of it? Or maybe we'll trade it in so we can have a discount on our, our new capital acquisition. So this, um, this graphic represents how our LBI engine collects data from multiple sources. So there's, uh, there's service data, which would be your preventive maintenance, qualification data, any repairs that are done, parts that are replaced, um, when it was done, who it was done by. There's the instrument operations data, which would be how many injections is it, has it run, um, what kind of utilization is, is going on with the instrument, uh, is it reporting a lot of error messages, that sort of thing. Then asset management data, which would be things like um, uh, where where it is in terms of inventory. Is it um, is it in your your lab in New Jersey, or maybe it's in your research lab that's in Germany, for example? Um, why is it there? What is it being used for? And then finally, um, the the last box on the bottom right is uh, custom customer data, which would include things like the condition of the instrument. Is it old? Is it new? Is it used heavily or barely used? Is it in a really harsh environment that's going to reduce its overall life cycle? And that brings us right into life cycle data, which is um, the overall age of the instrument, the condition of the instrument, and um, what technology generation is it? We think of technology generation as being N0 to N4, with zero being absolutely brand spanking new, cutting edge technology to N4 being um, obsoleted, no longer supported by the manufacturer, um, and very, very old technology. Then all of this data that the engine has been busy collecting will then be analyzed, and a variety of reports can and will be generated and available to our customers. There's some canned reports, like our subscription-based reports. These are stock reports that are, are really quick and easy to, to, to generate. Um, or they can be completely custom, like our ad hoc reports, which are 
on the fly, what do you need, we automatically uh, will we'll start working on doing a custom report solution for you. We can also do data analytics depending on what kind of, of analysis you want us to do on your data, what are you looking for, um, what are your goals. And then for the, the higher executive levels, um, these, these dashboards, um, which will help to give a quick snapshot of your laboratory risk and what your productivity is. And again, they are custom designed depending on what, what you're looking for. So there are three big topics of interest to our customers with LBI reporting. Obviously, we have many, many different types of reports, and that, that's just our canned reports, and then we can do anything custom beyond that. But the, the big three, the ones that we are consistently um, asked about, the ones our, our, our customers consistently want, are inventory, productivity, and life cycle. So inventory, tracking, and classification would be along the lines of what kinds of instruments you have, where they're located, in terms of what lab, what site, what country, what region, how old are these assets, are they still supported by the OEM, um, are parts still available to support them, uh, what kind of condition are they in, and how critical they are to your, to your operation. Again, this idea of if, if that instrument goes down and it's unavailable for testing, is it going to inhibit your ability to release product or is it going to bring your production lines down? Next is productivity. So what percent of time are they available? And then what is the utilization rate? What are the service metrics for each instrument, which would include all of your preventive maintenance, qualifications, and repair services? What is the asset performance? And are there training opportunities available that would increase your productivity? And if so, what kind? And finally, life cycle management or asset rationalization. We can pull data together um, and set criteria such as age, condition, supportability, redundancy, criticality, many others, um, and, and generate a list of potential candidates um, that uh, you can evaluate to decide should we retire them, replace them, uh, redeploy them, maybe um, maybe even just leave them where they are because there's even though it's old equipment and it's meeting all of our retirement criteria, it's a workhorse that never goes down. We, we it still has useful life in it. So before I really start to dig into these reports, I do want to take a moment to look at the overall solution that Laboratory Business Intelligence provides. The service that Agilent provides is an end-to-end -end solution. There's a lot of labor technology and knowledge that needs to collect all of the little bits and pieces of information that are floating around somewhere in your lab. Um, this data can take on many different forms. It can be in notebooks, log books, it may be in free text fields that are unsearchable and unqueryable, um, or it could be in, in, in any one of many different types of, of databases or data systems that you have, and that's just to name a few. After we've collected all that data, we collate it, and then we have to clean it up. You know, we have to put it in a usable format um, that, uh, that we can query and search and, and generate reports from. Once the data has been analyzed, we have powerful tools that we can use to interpret this data, query it and generate the reports, and then format those reports to meet your specific needs. Like what exactly do you want to look for? What's important to you? Our competitors, by and large, do not offer an end-to-end -end solution like we do. Their solution is focused around just the tools. So that's why I put up this slide to make you understand that there's um, a whole a beginning to end solution. Um, and that tools is only one part of it. Having the ability to say, oh, we can analyze your data and generate a report is just one piece of the entire, of the entire puzzle. So the global inventory view is a, a really popular report with our customers. It's called the global inventory view, but in reality, you can adjust the resolution and the, the table and chart will automatically adjust. So right now, it is truly at a global, uh, a global view if you're looking at the chart there on the right. Um, it, you can see different countries where they have uh, sites and, and, um, and there's a nice little breakdown in the bottom of the asset category. 
So um, you, you notice that there's a huge number of assets that are um, that are unclassified assets, and that's because this was generated right off the bat without us coming in to do any kind of an, of an inventory. This was the, the before picture, if you will. So as part of uh, our lab LBI solution, we come in and we classify all of your instrumentation for you so that you'll know exactly what type of instrumentation it is. Um, you can click on, let's say you just want to look at the, the, the site in Germany and at what assets they have in there. So if this was an interactive report, so just a screenshot, we could click on Germany, and um, the chart and the table would automatically adjust, and it would show um, information specific to the site or sites in Germany. Then you can drill this all the way down to individual assets to explore any outliers that you see. And each time that you change that resolution, the table and the chart will adjust automatically. So this ability to change the resolution and the configurability of these reports is really powerful. Um, and at the end of the day, we can help you see your inventory in the way that you need in real time. So as we're doing our presentations to you on a quarterly or monthly basis or however often you need, um, and, and you say, you know, I, I, really, I really need to change this. I want to see something that's more detailed, or I want to see more of a global view. We can change it on the fly immediately so that you have it right there at your fingertips. So uh, surface coverage is a re really a strategic decision. If you have critical instruments that are not under warranty, the percent of those instruments under contract should be pretty high. Um, Alternatively, if you're using a lot of time and materials to cover service calls and provide service on your instrumentation, this is a really expensive solution. It typically has slower response time, so it may or may not be the best option for you. It certainly would not be a good option for any of your critical instruments. An example of a critical instrument would be an instrument that if it goes down, production will go down, which would cost you hundreds of thousands, even millions of dollars a day um, the longer it's down. Think about what goals are important to you. What's more important, labor or capital? Do you want to keep your scientists doing science, or are you okay with them spending some of their time maintaining their own instruments? Are you more concerned with increasing utilization, or maybe focused on reducing your spend on waste? We can help you identify your goals if you don't already have them set by, by pulling this data. Or if you already have your goals defined, we can help you achieve them. We help you evaluate your needs, goals, and competencies to optimize your service coverage model based on your risk versus your profitability. For example, accounts that are have high risk instrumentation, maybe because they're, they're really old or there's no redundancies um, and production will go down if they go down, then you would likely want to have full contract on these instruments with the uh, highest amount of um, response time, best response time. If you're low risk, um, then you may want to consider other service options. You, know, you don't need uh, all the whistles and bells. You just need to have some kind of uh, coverage on them. So our next, uh, our next type of report are, is around productivity metrics. And productivity is a derived metric that reflects instrument availability as it is affected by downtime. Whether the downtime is planned, like with preventive maintenance or qualifications, or if it's unplanned, like in the case of repairs. For example, if you have one eight-hour shift and the instrument is down for four hours, the availability for that instrument on that day is only 50%. Availability should not be confused with utilization, which reflects when the instrument is actually being used to run the analysis. Um, maybe, maybe it's only being used for 30% of that 50% availability time, or maybe it's being used the entire time. Productivity um, has to be balanced with cost. Do you take your whole lab operation offline for a month to do all of your maintenance? I have a customer who does exactly this. Due to holidays and holiday shutdowns, they have all of their preventive maintenance and compliance requirements taken care of in the month of December. There's no production that happens. Literally all their labs shut down. They go to a skeleton crew. We come in and we take care of everything for them. 
Or do you want to spread your schedule downtown throughout the year and take down only a few instruments each month so then you don't have to pull your entire production down as well? Productivity reports can help you with this. Um, they can also help you with uh, help you know why an instrument is down. Was it because of a computer issue? Uh, was there a hardware repair that was needed? Um, was it planned in the case of preventive maintenance or qualifications? Or maybe it was down because it's part of an investigation. Knowing this type of information gives you the opportunity to make improvements across your lab. Asset rationalization helps you identify candidates for replacement and, uh, and disposition. It also helps you to optimize your technology. Again, think about what, what, what are your goals? What are you trying to achieve? Maybe your goal is to do all the work you currently do with 10% less lab equipment. Um, for example, you may want to replace uh, aging equipment with newer technology that would allow you to do the work faster. So maybe replace three old pieces of equipment with two new cutting edge uh, rapid resolution LCs that would reduce your, your average run time from 30 minutes to eight, for example. Um, we would work with you to determine what criteria needs to be set in order to meet uh, your, your threshold for assets that are going to be flagged for, for consideration. This could be um, their annual failure rates. Um, are they at their end of guaranteed support? Are there still parts available? How much time, um, how much downtime that they had over a period of time, say a year? Um, how many service calls have have been uh, have been logged against that particular piece of equipment. You then balance this with the cost of the equipment, the criticality of that instrument to your operation, and and other criteria. Um, so to, to make a decision as to whether or not to um, to go ahead and think about uh, retiring or redeploying the piece of equipment. Um, you may want to leave it just where it is. For example. If you have an NMR in your lab that it may be five years old, but it costs millions of dollars, so you want to keep it online for many more years so that you make sure that you're getting the highest ROI as you can out of that piece of equipment. We help you determine the logical filters to use, how to come up with a potential list of candidates, and then you consider these and decide whether or not to retire, redeploy, trade them in, or even leave the equipment where it is, like in the case of the NMR I just uh, spoke about. LBI helps you better manage your lab business performance using the information contained in these reports. Depending on what your management objectives are, reports are often configured and designed with the customer to make sure that you can see what data and what views you need to meet those, um, those business objectives, those management objectives. So um, we're going to take a, a few minutes to talk about Remote Advisor now. So Remote Advisor is a standalone product, but it's also one of the potential data sources that can feed into LBI. Um, and that's why I'm calling it out separate from, from LBI, because it has that dual functionality. There's three basic components to Remote Advisor. There's Assist, um, Alert, and Report. Uh, assist and alert we'll go through in a little bit. Um, report, I wanted to point out to you, it's, um, the, the remote advisor reports are, are, are very insightful. They give you a lot of detail. They do not have the same level of detail or the same level of configuration as LBI. Um, and of course, the focus is, is narrowed just to remote advisor, whereas LBI draws from many different sources of information. However, it is one, one option to, um, to gather some of the information, particularly about the availability of the instrument, utilization, um, and tracking all the, the errors and different uh, maintenance procedures that are performed on it. So uh, we have this idea of an expert virtual support. You, you simply click on the icon on your desk. It automatically connects you with an Agile engineer who can begin troubleshooting with you. Um, that will help speed the process of correctly identifying problems and, and, and get the right resource out to you to get your instrument up and running as quickly as possible.
So Remote Advisor Assist um, has uh, Push for Help, uh, which allows you to have real-time collaboration with the Agile engineers. You bypass all of the call center queues, um, all the phone trees, or if you log online, you don't have to you don't have to worry about logging a call online and waiting for someone to call you back. Instead, you just click on the Push for Help button, and it will automatically connect you with, with Agilent. You can also push all of your instrument vitals, uh, logbook information, everything directly to Agilent. So the Agilent engineer sees exactly what you're seeing. They see all the error messages. They, they see um, the problem. Like if it's a baseline problem, they can see it right then and there. Um, this, of course, allows them to be able to have improved troubleshooting, as you can imagine. And it saves you time. So this just gives you a, a, a little visual of, of what happened. So you know, today, uh, if you don't have Remote Advisor, you call into our 1-800 our number. Um, you troubleshoot over the phone with an Agile engineer. They may have to set up a WebEx, or you may have to take screenshots and email it to them. It's, it's, a, it's a little bit more cumbersome than using Remote Advisor, whereas in Remote Advisor, when you click the button, the Remote Advisor program automatically gathers up all the information, puts it in a package, and sends it off to, to the Agile engineer that's helping you. Um, so it's a much cleaner, much easier, much faster way of, of troubleshooting. Then we have Remote Advisor Alert. Um, and what, what Remote Advisor Alert does is it will contact you either through email or through text message um, when your instrument has gone down or when a maintenance threshold is about to be reached. So in the case of the maintenance threshold, this allows you to plan your preventive maintenance downtime um, in a fashion that will minimize the the impact to your overall production <coughs> and productivity. Excuse me. In the case of um, uh, your instrument unexpectedly shutting down, say in the middle of a run, you can immediately go and address the situation and probably get it up and going as quickly as possible. So not only are you going to minimize your downtime, but uh, you'll also minimize things like waste because your pump won't be just continue to pump solvent. Your lamp will not be just continuing to burn, but no analysis being generated off of it. So the overall costs will, will drop considerably. So Remote Advisor uses a, uh, a software platform that's called Exita that securely moves your data between the customer your site and, and to Agilent. There's a gateway computer um, that doesn't require any kind of a VPN or anything like that, but it does have a dedicated IP address. Um, and it's on, uh, on your side of the firewall. And it connects to all of the instruments, and it's the only point that connects out to the, uh, to the Internet. It collects information from the instruments and ports it over to Agilent. There is no connection with your data system, though. We only collect metadata, such as the number of injections, the liters of solvents that was used, any error messages, logbooks, that kind of thing. We don't have access to or collect any information on your chromatographic data, chromatograms, or what is being injected. So I'd like to close our presentation with this final slide. Um, and, and this is just a handful of some of, uh, some of the comments that we've gotten from our customers. Um, and, the, uh, and, and I won't read through them. You can, you can read through them at your leisure. But you know, it, it essentially talks about after implementing Remote Advisor, what were some of the benefits that they achieved. And I, I do want to draw your attention to this comment in the top right that we are connected with Remote Advisor in six of the top ten pharma companies worldwide. Uh, these are the most heavily regulated companies out there. They have very stringent criteria around uh, all of their, their IT um, data and databases. Um, and we're, our, our product meets, not only meets their needs and they feel comfortable with having us install it, but then they see 
um, some really nice benefits, some increases in productivity and decreases in, in total cost of ownership from, from utilizing this. So that concludes uh, my presentation. I want to take a, uh, a, another moment just to thank you again for all of your time. There are some reference resources um, that are available. You should see them in the, the box on your, on your screen to get some additional information. Um, and at this time, I'd like to open the floor to questions. And uh, I think Tanuja will be, uh, will be taking care of uh, moderating that. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Shreya. I think it was a very uh, very informative, very comprehensive talk, and I hope the attendees have benefited from it. And this is also the time for all of you online to ask Shreya any questions that you may be facing, um, uh, you know, about any problems that you may be facing in your lab with regards to productivity or any of the other topics that she has covered in her talk. But let me start out by asking you, Shreya, you, you did mention a couple of times that Really, this is a customized, you know, flexible solution that can be uh, adopted by any lab, whether it's large or small. But um, with regards to that, I mean, is there a minimum number of instruments or a certain, you know, sort of threshold that you must reach before you take advantage of, you know, the solution that you have to offer? So, <clears throat> because it is customized, we can we can do the solution for any number of instruments. Even if you only have one or two instruments, we could do it. Um, would that make financial sense? Um, probably not. Uh, that, would, that would have to be something that we would weigh out for you. Um, with regards to remote advisor, uh, typically we say a minimum of 10 instruments. Um, that would be a good balance, 10 and up. And with LBI, because it's so much more comprehensive and we we get so, uh, so much data from multiple different sources, and there's that heavy investment both in terms of labor and in, and in the technology and tools itself. Um, typically, we say you probably want to be around 40 or 50 instruments to really benefit from that. But uh, we, we can do it for any size engagement, any number of instruments. Okay. That's, that's really good to know. And then um, as people are thinking about you know, investing, what are some of the factors that they should really consider when determining whether this is, you know, it, it can really, uh, you know, pay off? Or what are the factors that they should consider for determining their return on investment? So um, that's, that's a little bit complicated to answer. There's no really one can answer because every customer is different and their focus is different. Their um, management objectives are, are, are different. So we would um, we would engage with them in an initial conversation where we would kind of hash all this out and talk about you know what are your goals what do you want to accomplish what what are the things that you want to bring focus to um, and then we can start working out what solution is going to best suit their needs um, and it, like I said it's, it's it really is all custom um, so I don't really have a, a black and white answer to give you. <laughs> Got it. But at least, I mean, it, it tells people that they have to start this dialogue with the vendor. And, you know, yeah. it's it's really a back and forth, and it's more, you know, along the lines of a partnership to really make it, you know, work best. So that's good. Um, the other question yeah. is, um, do you need to actually have a cross-lab agreement in place before you can, you know, take advantage of the remote advisor part of the solution? Yeah. No, nope, okay. you sure don't. Um, uh, remote advisor can be with any contract, um, and in fact, uh, with with some contracts, we even offer it uh, free of charge um, for for a certain number of instruments to kind of get your feet wet. Um, but uh, the cross lab uh, enterprise solution that that's our total lab solution, and and remote advisor and and. Uh, LBI do feed into that, which is why I brought it to your attention today, because mm -hmm. that's where at the at the cross lab enterprise level is where you're going to see the maximum productivity, the maximum amount of benefit that we can give to you on our whole suite of services. Got it. Okay. And integration seems to be very key, you know, to make all this work. So the question is, like, do you need internet connectivity at your instruments in order to facilitate that kind of integration with, you know, your data analysis and stuff? No, no. Actually, um, 
your instruments will not be connected, or at least it's not a requirement for us, for them to be connected to the Internet at all. The only thing that needs to be connected is that gateway computer, um, and, and that, that will have the Internet connection to port over the information to the Agilent engineers. But, um, but for your individual instruments, they will be connected to the gateway computer, but they will not be connected to the Internet. Okay. And let me uh, talk a little about the, the multi-vendor uh, lab services aspect of your talk. So can you point out to people what some of the, the strengths and limitations are of choosing one model over the other? Um, shoot, I have, a, I have a slide on that, and it's not part of this presentation. Uh, that's, a, that's a really good question. So um, I'll start with, with some of the benefits with uh, a single source provider or multi-vendor provider, um, and, and that is that you you reduce the amount of, of overall cost of ownership, um, the amount of time that you have to spend in engaging with vendors because rather than having to re renew many different contracts and have many POs issued and spend time with negotiating all that with, with all the different vendors. You only have one, one vendor, one contract, one PO that uh, you have to deal with. So obviously on the front end, that automatically that's like your first benefit that you see typically. Right. Um, and then, then moving forward, you have um, all of your protocols are completely harmonized with Agilent. Um, so rather than having each different manufacturer have their own type of, of protocol, um, and it may or may not cover the exact same tests as other vendors, um, it doesn't have the same look and feel, uh, maybe their criteria is different. We, our, all of our protocols are completely harmonized, so that helps to re reduce your regulatory risk and, the, and your, your costs as well. Um, and then, of course, we have all of, uh, and these are, those are just what we would call our instrument services benefits, our multi-vendor mm -hmm. instrument services benefits. But then if you go beyond that and start moving into an enterprise solution, that's when you start getting your your dedicated account manager, your dedicated workload administrator, dedicated on-site engineers and parts cache. All of this helps to reduce your, your um, instrument downtime and increase your response time um, and get your instruments up and going as quickly as possible, which of course reduces your overall cost of ownership as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, some, of the, some of the drawbacks, um, I really can't think of one. <laughs> There's, there's, if you go to different models, um, like if you look, at, for example, at, uh, at an ISO agreement, um, that's an independent service organization agreement, um, they do tend to be cheaper than, uh, than OEMs or multi-vendor solution contracts, mm -hmm. but their depth of knowledge tends to be very, very shallow. They only know what they know on a particular suite of instruments, um, and they can't really go or grow beyond that. They have limited resources and limited knowledge um, knowledge bases to, to increase uh, their, their service offering. Um, if you look at just looking at a, a single OEM, um, obviously their, their depth of knowledge is, is superb, um, but then you run into these issues of wanting to have harmonized protocols and, and wanting to only have to deal with one vendor. Um, and uh, for your uh, uh, enterprise solution, of course, it takes care of it takes care mm -hmm. of all of that. So it's not going to be as cheap as uh, as an ISO, but the depth of knowledge will be there, um, mm -hmm. and uh, and you'll be able to apply it across your entire lab instead of individual manufacturers. I see. Okay. Well, that's again good to know. And then, do do people uh, do the labs actually have to put some things in place? before actually switching from, you know, like a single vendor to a multi-vendor concept? So in large part, that depends on, on how your SOPs are written. And as part of the, the initial conversations prior to implementation, we would sit down with, with you and have this discussion about what needs to happen before we transition over. And frequently an option that our customers um, will do is rather than having it all start like, you know, as of January 1st, we're going to change everything over. They will kind of do it in a phased format and, and mm -hmm. take like a certain portion of the lab or maybe a certain type of uh, instrumentation or, you know, one manufacturer at a time, whatever suits their needs the best, and then have it kind of roll up over a period of time. Um, 
and that that just makes the transition a little easier, I think. Sure, and that makes sense because then that way you can work out any kinks along the way rather than, you know, just doing an on and off. Uh, the, yeah. And also there are already some contracts that may be in place which expire at a later date or whatever. So I guess phasing it out also helps take care of all those hassles. Yes, so, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And and then finally, you, we talked about small and large labs, but can you also comment about this model in an academic setting versus, you know, a, a biotech or a pharmaceutical setting. I'm, I'm assuming that, you know, the industry is more inclined to take this model because productivity and, you know, full-time employee, co- you know, compensation and all that factors in more in an in in an industrial setting. But do you think this also brings value to an academic setting? I do. So, um, you know, in academia, frequently things like uh, productivity is not at the top of your your list. You're focused on on other pursuits. Um, but still, you know, knowing where your your assets are and how they're being used, um, knowing how often that, that that they're down, and reducing that total cost of ownership. These types of things apply to to anybody using any piece of equipment, no matter where they are. You know, especially when you start talking about uh, reducing reducing waste, reducing spend, reducing total cost of ownership. Because I know that, uh, at least in my experience, my academic accounts are are always uh, struggling to get funding from um, from the universities. And so, um, if they can if they can minimize those those costs, or if they can look at uh, asset rationalization, where they can get turn in some old equipment and get a discount on, on a new capital acquisition. Um, that's something that they tend to be more focused on, and it certainly uh, benefits from, from going to one of our technology solutions. Right. And also, I guess, if they uh, start sharing resources, like you mentioned earlier, it's harder for them to do, but once they start thinking about you know, sharing resources and then putting a bunch of different instruments under this kind of a model, then I think it would make more sense for them to justify this, um, you know, from a funding perspective as well. Yeah, so a, a lot of times in academia, uh, there will be the same university, but each each lab will have a couple pieces of equipment, and they all manage their, their equipment differently from their, their colleagues. Um, mm-hmm. So it does, it does make sense to, rather than approaching your, your service from a piecemeal standpoint, to um, to put everything under one contract, because you'll see a lot more cost savings that way. Sure. All right. I think we've touched on all the big issues that we needed to. So thank you a lot. Thanks a lot for the presentation and also for taking the questions. Um, I just wanted to remind people that you can see the link to the archive on your website, but you will also be emailed this link in a couple of days. But more importantly, Shay's contact information is on there. If you need to reach out to her for a copy of the slides or if additional questions come to mind or you need some guidance on how to go about, uh, you know, thinking about making this, you know, big shift in lab productivity, definitely reach out to her. I'm sure she'll be happy to help you out. So on behalf of Lab Manager, I would once again like to thank our sponsor, Agile and Technologies, for both their participation and support of this event. Thank you again, Shay, for uh, putting the talk together. And thanks to those of you online for your time and attention. The webinar will be archived at least you know, for a few months on Lab Manager's website. So do visit us online because you'll not only see this webinar, you will also have access to um, you know, past webinars that we have done that may be of interest. And we are continually updating our website with new webinar topics. So until next time, everyone, goodbye and good luck. Thank you.